Hi, my name is Jan Wilczek from thewolfsound.com. Welcome to Wolf Talk, a podcast about audio programming. In this podcast, you will learn how to build your career in programming or research related to audio, meet programmers and researchers from all around the world and learn about the intricacies of sound. Hi, what's up everybody? Welcome to the second session of the Wolf Talk podcast. Today I'm very excited because I got the chance to interview a member of the Alto Acoustics Lab of the Alto University. Leonardo Fierro is doing his PhD and teaches audio signal processing. We'll discuss his background and motivation to get into audio research. We'll talk what audio research involves and also how you can start working towards your PhD in audio research and what you will need for this. As usual, all references in this podcast can be found under thewolfsound.com slash talk002. Once again, thewolfsound.com slash talk002. So let's begin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second session of the Wolf Talk podcast. And I have Leonardo here. Thank you for agreeing on this interview. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. Could you introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, well, of course. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Leonardo Fierro. You know me well already, but um, I'm a member of the Alto Acoustics Lab. I'm a PhD student, a candidate in the audio signal processing group. Uh, my supervisor is Professor Beza Valimaki. I'm in my third year now, which means that I'm uh, basically halfway through uh, my, the completion of my PhD studies. And my topics, uh, my research topics are mainly timescale modification and transient modeling and compression. Uh, besides my uh, research activity, I am also a rugby player. I play for the local Helsinki uh, rugby club team. And I enjoy doing some music every once in a while, which is, seems to be pretty common among <laughs> us uh, audio enthusiasts. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, is that how you ended up at Alto? Like, was music your primary interest to, to somehow show up here? Maybe, uh, maybe you can share the whole story. Of how yeah, you... I was about to ask you about the short <laughs> story or the long story. Well, uh, the long story is uh, I actually I don't have a proper audio background. I my my field of study throughout the bachelor and the masters in Italy in Brescia, where I uh, come from, was actually telecommunication engineering. I've always been uh, passionate about audio because like I've been recording songs for like a plenty plenty mm -hmm. of time right now, and that was my my conjunction. But I never never had any proper studies in uh, in the matter up until the masters. During the masters, I had this audio signal processing course in my master that was uh, communication technologies and multimedia and I found the course to be like really really interesting it was applying all of those uh, parts of my studies that I really liked in a context that to me like r resonated a lot and the way I ended up in Alto is like actually really funny because when it came the time for me like to do to choose the topic for my thesis back back in Italy um, I couldn't find anything that was interesting me from like what what uh, my professors had to offer and uh, I was also kind of lucky and then I earned it of course it's 50 and 50 but I got like a scholarship to do a thesis abroad so I just randomly shot an email at that point to my current boss saying hey I am this random guy from Italy that is seeking uh, a thesis in uh, in, in audio signal processing, do you have any openings if you know that you don't have to pay for me? And he said, sure, just come here and, and work with us. And I work with my current supervisor, Professor Vesa Valimaki. I work with uh, Yussi Ramo, which used to be uh, a member here at the lab. And we did a really interesting uh, work on loudness compensation, mm -hmm. uh, which turned out to be my thesis and uh, uh, a paper in some music and computing conference in 2019. And at the end of my master's work, I just told my boss, hey, just if there is any opening for like a PhD position, just let me know. 
I came back to Italy. I actually started working in Milan uh, for a period. And while I was working there, uh, Visa con contacted me again saying, hey, there is an opening. Are you interested? And essentially, that's how I ended up here permanently, sort of. Yeah, that's really cool. I often find it uh, interesting that there, there's this common ground between communications and audio. And I feel there are like people who benefit from taking like courses from, from the two. And I also like that you called called Vesa like through email and he agreed. That's, that's actually pretty cool. Maybe a word of explanation. It's quite common here at Alto that when people do their master's thesis, then afterwards they write a, a paper out of it, mm -hmm. which I guess is kind of a condensed thesis. Exactly. Yeah. It, it basically, it, as you said, it's a condensed version of the thesis where it essentially just brings up the novelty of your work. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the background is really summarized because typically what we want in thesis is that you also, you want to show up that, you know, the background and, and the literature of the work you have conducted. But yeah, literally the, the paper just summarizes it and makes it more accessible to the scientific community, essentially. Yeah, and that's, that's what I hope will happen with my master's thesis eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's really cool that you got to, to, to a PhD position here. And uh, for people who like don't know what PhD in audio <laughs> is, like how would you define it in your own words? That is actually, you know, not a trivial question. There are <laughs> plenty, plenty of people that don't know that. And People should know it, especially students throughout their, their bachelor or master's. So essentially, the, the PhD studies, or this stands for Doctor of Philosophy, condensed uh, doctoral studies, is um, essentially like a, a path, like a, a path of studies that should bring you to be uh, a researcher. It, it's a path that is meant to tell you, to teach you how to do research, how to learn how to do research, and how to defend your own work once you produce it. Um, typically, the length of the of the PhD studies is either three or four years, depending on whether you have to put in some study credits, because sometimes you're mm -hmm. required to follow some courses, sometimes you're not. Uh, different institutions have different rules. But that's the goal. Uh, you want to learn how to do research. You want to become the expert in your in your field of study, uh, which of course is very specialized because mm -hmm. it's what it's meant to be with with the doctoral studies. And uh, the very important part at the very end, which is the the dissertation that you have to compile and the def public defense that you have to get, which is meant to show and to prove that you can defend your own work. Also, of course, like if I'm not mistaken, because I actually haven't studied Latin even though I'm I'm Italian, uh, the terms of like doctoral degree or doctoral studies comes from uh, licentia. Uh, what was that again? I don't remember. Uh, licentia docenti or something like that. I pardon my my Latin, <laughs> uh, which essentially meant means like license to teach. So mm, what nice. you're supposed to be that <laughs> is when you come out of the. Of, of your PhD studies, you are the expert in your field and you also have the ability to teach um, your knowledge and pass your knowledge to someone else. And that's why um, basically nowadays to teach in like a academic institution like university or others, mm -hmm. you're required to have like a PhD degree of some kind. Nice. I think like showing it, it should be like on a, on a commercial that like do a PhD with us will give you a license to teach. Yeah, there will there'll be something. <laughs> and so for you specifically, can you name like the most important reason why did you want to do a PhD? I know you had interest in audio, but was this was this the reason? So something else? Uh, well, I have, let's say, two major uh, motives, two major reasons why I decided to do a PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one being that I am not really good at doing like a repetitive job. Mm -hmm. I really like like uh, trying to like perfect something and push the boundaries of something further, which is essentially what like doing research is about. Mm -hmm. You want to push the boundary of knowledge a little bit further. If you're really good, like very further, but like, <laughs> I'm I'm okay with doing like step by step with it, and that was the uh, the, the the main reason uh, essentially. And the second one that comes after, like I'm really passionate about teaching, and then I figured out, okay, if maybe that wants to be my future one day, like being a lecturer of some kind. This may be maybe the path that I have to take, and the reason why I ended up choosing like a PhD in audio is that essentially I found out, okay, 
in this particular moment of my life, I feel this is what I'm really passionate about. Although, like, I don't have the strongest of the background, especially being here at Alt Acoustics mm-hmm. Club. We have so many great minds and people around, but, like, it's such a stimulating environment. Then I said, okay, I want to be around these kind of people. Let's go for this. Yeah, that's, that's some really beautiful points uh, to mention, like, that you not only want to extend what is, like, known, but also you want to bring it to others through teaching. And also this aspect of uh, putting yourself to a very, I, I wouldn't say competitive because it's, it doesn't feel like competition here, but it's more like everyone is doing amazing stuff with sound. So you also feel like mm. uh, obliged to up your game and like also do something interesting there and put in the work and, and put, in, put in the research. So uh, like what's what's the best thing you would say about this? Is it is it the, the teaching or maybe the satisfaction that comes from successful research? Well, at least when you're studying your PhD and you're doing your PhD studies, uh, your teaching part is somehow very limited. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, there are some occasions and there are people here in the lab that actually have are, hold, are holding their own course and they are the main instructors but like you're typically you're gradually inserted into teaching by supervising some thesis and uh, doing some teaching assistant work mm-hmm. so I would say of course the most, the most satisfa- satisfying part of your uh, PhD path or, or the path like to get a doctor uh, doctoral degree is starting with like the the get, getting the feeling, getting acquainted with the feeling that you have produced something that is completely new. You you get like okay, thanks to your work now the um, scientific community's knowledge is like a little bit deeper on mm-hmm. something, and that is actually like a really nice feeling, especially like if you work and you get like nice results every once in a while, <laughs> uh, you really feel like okay, I did something meaningful. And uh, that's also like a, a, a topic to debate very, very often, like how much, mo- like doing research for impact, how much impact have your research? And of course, like our field is audio. So like it's especially from outsiders, like might feel very um, limited in terms of impact, but it's really not. And the feeling that you get when you have pushed, actually, you went a little bit further and you got something new is like, to me, it's really cool mm-hmm. to begin with. So I wanted to ask, because... We were talking about doing a PhD. So what does it involve? I, I would say describe your typical day, but then do you have a typical day at all? Uh, it's uh, not really like I like as, as I like to say to people that are not like involved in the in academia uh, on cool days, like on, on good days, I do like cool stuff with music. I write about nice stuff. And I I get to like give some lectures or talk to people about mm-hmm. my work. And on bad days, I'm sitting at my desk coding or correcting assignments. That's like the simplest way that you can put like a, a typical PhD day. And I don't think it exists. So uh, first of all, time management is like a key factor that like can be that can kill your days or make make your life much easier. But essentially, you're dividing your time between um, reading about literature, so mm-hmm. find out uh, about uh, new upcomings in your field, uh, then work on your own research. So do whatever it takes. It might be might go from like you know, as I said, just coding or like testing stuff out, doing simulations, doing tests or listening tests. We have beautiful equipment and facilities here at the lab. Um, discuss with your peers. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have like, of course, if you have the teaching activities, then you have all that part too. But then you have you might also have those extra events like uh, you're attending a conference, maybe or a talk or something mm-hmm. like that. So it's uh, it's hard to it's hard to feel that two days are the same in the life of a of a researcher in general and like in, in on a more uh, smaller base like a PhD students. Which is, is pretty cool if you ask me. Like I hate monotony and, and routine. So okay, yeah, that's that's uh, that seems a, a nice fit then then for you. And uh, when you actually get to do research, because mm-hmm. I heard that it, it may be sometimes really challenging to to then get to the point when you actually can sit down and do something, uh, because there is a lot going on. Mm-hmm. So what does your specific research involve? I know that uh, you do a lot with, with transients. I also uh, listened to your, to your presentation about the 
Citrano app <laughs> and it will be included in the notes to this to this podcast but uh, could you tell the audience what what's your research about yeah as you mentioned like i i think i kind of became the transience guy here <laughs> at the lab now but that, that's why that's of course where where my research is like heading uh heading right now as i as i mentioned earlier on like the core topic of my research so far has been time scale modification which is uh basically um the stretching or compression of the time axis, which means uh, pl- changing the playback time of a of a sound to make it sound to make it play like slower or faster, but without changing um, its uh, its frequency components. So, so it's something like that we have on YouTube, right? That we can like exactly, have, yeah, yeah. That's a, norm, that's the normal speed, and then like when you're listening to let's say Wolf, Wolf Sound YouTube channel, you then hit tw- <laughs> two times the speed, and like mm-hmm. so, how is it how is it possible to uh, have something like this? It, well, of course, there are plenty of like methods and involved uh, that are involved, but it's exactly as you said when you are having like a change of of tempo and like in the production of a video or other examples because maybe people don't use that function, but maybe you're listening to an audio book and you're gonna go mm-hmm. like faster because we don't have, really have time to lose, or you're trying to learn a new language on Duolingo, you wanna go like a, a little a little slower when you're listening to some words, mm-hmm. or like the oldest uh, application for TSM where essentially um, either music production of some kind, you know, I don't know if you have ever had the experience of like recording really bad rappers, but when you have to put them on tempo with a beat, like you have to, <laughs> that's like, <laughs> uh, like great experience. <laughs> and also like in, um, in broadcasting, like TV or radio, sometimes you have to feed like a program or an ad, like in a given time slot. And that's what it, it came out. There are plenty of techniques like, you know, there have been time domain, frequency domain, hybrid techniques that, that are involved in that. Uh, the the current state of the art is still a uh, method that was made uh, here in the lab by uh, a former member, uh, Eropeka Damshak, with uh, my boss, uh, Veza Valimakin, that we have tried. We are trying to improve and we did some side work on it. Um, yeah, essentially, like, uh, there were so many methods. I don't know how many, how much time do we want to go in detail with that. But the, the idea is just that you take something in our, like, uh, real world time axis and you just relocate it and rearrange it in a way in a new fake time axis which is either shorter or mm-hmm. longer um trying to avoid all of that all of those artifacts and phenomenon that come up when you do recombine stuff uh so there's lots of phase processing involved and checking that things don't break when you mix them and how did i get to transit from that is that uh we found out that a really good way of approaching the, this kind of uh, time scale modification mm-hmm. was to um, essentially approach the audio input with the idea that it belongs to a model that is called uh, either si- science plus transience plus noise or harmonic percussive residual it has different names but the idea is that we can think of any audio input as a combination of three uh, mm-hmm. different audio events something that is very steady state very uh, sinusoidal so like a combination of mm-hmm. signs really typical Fourier transform approach a combination of impulsive events so clicks or percussion percussions or transient mm-hmm. sounds and the rest so we call them noise but it's essentially all the nuances of the sound that don't really belong to one or the other category and we kind of find out that if you approach like your audio input in that way and you kind of divide the three things then the whole time scale modification thingy works so much better and we know we basically it, there are plenty of sinusoidal models out there that work greatly mm-hmm. uh noise is kind of easy to treat like at the end of the day you just randomize stuff and pretty much everything works so the only thing left to work in was like improving the whole transient uh, approach so we kind of took a step back um and our idea was like, okay, let's try to figure out how this transient work a little bit better. Mm-hmm. And this is where like my my research is heading uh, right now. I can't talk too much about that, of <laughs> course, but that's essentially what what, what we're what we're doing at the moment. Uh, that's, that's I think it's a really important point that you mentioned. Also, uh, what what my my mentor Emmanuel Emmanuel Habit said that in order to solve some problem, we need to understand it very yeah, very well that's... in the first place. That's a really good point. So in this context, could you tell the audience about the Citrano application? <laughs> sure, sure. So um, Citrano is like, that gives its name from, gets its name from the science, transients and noise model. And it's essentially like a toolbox that is available on my on my GitHub and uh, 
it also like as a proper uh, publication, a proper paper in this year's uh, Digital Audio Effects Conference. So you can also which will be linked to in the reference notes. So go check that out. <laughs> <laughs> and it is essentially like a, a toolbox that is given for like uh, testing and visual evaluation of uh, separation techniques. Uh, what happened was there during like the, the part of my research when I was like uh, studying the um, TSM via the SDN model and trying like to find a way of improving it. I was kind of selecting uh, different kind of uh, separation techniques that were available in literature mm -hmm. nowadays. And I wanted to see like when they were doing good, when they were doing bad and in which, and in which situation, but it wasn't that straightforward. Um, given that for both problems, timescale modification and the SDN separation, there is no ground truth. So you actually don't know what mm -hmm. you get. Yeah, do yeah. you want to go get at the end? Hence, you don't really have an objective evaluation to rely on. Unless, you, unless you synthesize the data yourself. Like you, you artificially have transient yes, sounds and noise. But, but they, yeah, but they have to be, you know, perfect. It's really hard. Yeah. To get and you don't really get those kind of sounds in real life. And yeah, exactly. So what's the point at the end of the day? Uh, but yeah, that was exactly the point. So he said, okay, I have all this code, all these like plots of these techniques. Is there a way that I can put them together and make them accessible to mm -hmm. people that want to try the same thing? And that's how the idea for, for Citrano came in the first place. So Citrano is essentially like a toolbox that gives you at the same time the choice uh, of different separation methods. You just mm -hmm. input uh, an audio sound and it plots automatically, of course, the waveform uh, the way it is with some, some of the spectrograms of the different parts. But I think the coolest part of it is that uh, you can uh, essentially like... At, at, in real time in there, you can just adjust uh, the three components in there and mm -hmm. remix your sound. So you can s uh, immediately see at the same time what happens if you have like a lower percentage of um, signs in there or like you only have transients or zero transients and how it changes mm -hmm. immediately, which is really cool. And it's also like I found out like a really nice, it has a really nice educational value for people that don't know anything about this topic. I found out that explaining it while showing that what was happening in Citran was much easier to get the, you know, the concept nailed in. And yeah, so Citran is essentially, it's already available on GitHub. Of course, like uh, I don't, I don't think of myself as like the best programmer out there. Plus, uh, Citrano is uh, developed in MATLAB, so it has all these mm -hmm. limits. But there should be like a, a big upgrade coming up soon that like would improve performance drastically and add a few features and also in the future i would like as soon as like some of my research is published and i can actually share it with the world uh, add that to, to citrano i would uh, like to add also like a in, like immediate time scale modification feature inside it so mm -hmm. it's uh two things with like one two birds with one stone mm -hmm. and yeah so if you feel like giving it a try go and check it it's really awesome because I've heard I heard this great piece of advice one day that like what to do if you want to do great research. The first thing to do is do like a proper literature research. So like see what has been already been done. Mm -hmm. And at that point, uh, if you have like this uh, these uh, separation methods, okay, you can read the papers and you have results. But now like how do you somehow go about this to, I don't know, improve something. And what you did is, is great in the sense that it allows everyone who wants to get into that topic, see like what's the current state of the art and then build up on this, or as you said, maybe simply learn. And I, I would imagine also for companies that would like to use this, it's also a great way to prototype stuff and see what would work best in their case without having to implement their, implement it on their own. So, uh, there's, there's huge potential in this, I think. And on a related note, uh, you, you mentioned that it was published on, on, on Dafix, mm -hmm. which is, uh, as maybe the audience doesn't know it, Dafix is a digital audio effects conference that take, takes place every year. And it basically unites people from who, who do audio. This is, I would say, more related to music rather than uh, speech that's my that yeah i would say more yeah more than in the in the in the i would say in the, it's it, it, we could fairly call it like the audio effects mm -hmm. world, which uh, gets all of this um digital audio audio signal processing 
uh, aspect that are it's pretty wide. But yeah, of course, maybe interests less whoever is in the speech world or le- or less who works in spo- spatial audio, for mm-hmm. example. Yes, I think definitely. they would target target something else. So typically in DAFX, you find research like mine or any kind of uh, things that are related in uh, more traditional aspects of the signal audio signal processing mm-hmm. world. Yeah, and for me, there's the sound synthesis aspect. Yes, and that's like a pretty big <laughs> one. Usually, you know, sound synthesis, physical modeling, um, uh, any kind of uh, time frequency uh, visualization and um, analysis of like different kind of um, audio inputs, mm-hmm. that we're going to call it. Like, yeah. it, it, it's so wide that uh, it's really hard like to categorize this, uh, categorize it that way. And that's true. So uh, you did a paper for this. You also had previous publications, like the one you mentioned about the master thesis research. And at this point, I, I really would like to ask you, uh, what was the process behind writing these papers? Like, could you do? Do you have now a certain way to approach this? And how did those papers look when you developed them? Well, there are like essentially two approaches to write a paper, one that is really good and one that is not that good. Uh, ideally, everyone wants to do the first one. We kind of like kind of drop towards the second one. But like there is a really good approach at writing paper that is while you're doing research. So even though you're you, you when you kind of know where you want to go, but even when you're like uh, paperwork is not completely defined. So you're working toward a goal, but you're still in the in uh, in the research phase. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You start writing your paper. So you let you lay down the background work that you did on it. You write down the things you're doing, so that you never. It really helps you keeping track of what you're doing inside mm-hmm. your work, and it really like gives a shape of the project you're gonna do. Also remember that we are in academia where the publish or perish concept is still there. So it really helps you give an idea when you have enough novelty to publicate something, mm-hmm. to publish something, sorry. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's I think, the best approach. As uh, along the research you're conducting, you write piece by piece whatever mm-hmm. you're doing and then you assemble the puzzle. Then you got the semi-wrong one, which is like you do your research first, then you realize, oh, damn, I have to publish this. <laughs> so you start like from the very beginning to the very end and you just write the story. But that's uh, essentially it. Uh, every paper is a story that you're telling your audience in some mm-hmm. kind. And it's always, of course, uh, the way you're writing a paper has to reflect the target that you're having. So whether the conference or the or the journal mm-hmm. that you're aiming to. But essentially, you're telling a story by giving like a reason why you're writing it. Enough background for like any reader to understand mm-hmm. uh, the reason why you're doing it. And explaining the novelty that you have and usually proving it, whether it's like in our field, it's really common having listening tests of some kind or any any kind of objective information gets there. And this is like how a paper takes 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 shape, takes form. Okay, and is it like a stressful process? Because I, I only hear the signals that people are like, oh, I need to write this paper or finish this paper. So is it does it involve like stress or it, tension? It is always stressful because like, yeah, p- publishing a paper is a, is a big thing. It's like how it's it's kind of, it's sad to say, but it's a little bit like the currency of the, mm-hmm. of the academic world. It's how you present yourself, uh, the impact of your research output and the, like the, how wide your research output is are really like, for someone that doesn't know you as a person, as a researcher, mm-hmm. like those are st- strong in, uh, indicators of the person that you are. Um, yeah, and also like, y- given that we have so many things to do at the, at the same time while you're doing research and any other activities, uh, unless you're like very uh, methodic and diligent person, you always end up working close to deadlines. Mm-hmm. And that's why it becomes like a stressful project. Um, uh, process you just have to meet deadlines and keep in check with them and it's part of you know it's it's part of the things that we have to learn here how to meet deadlines and when you're essentially working with yourself there is no one else dictating your yeah. your work frame exactly i think it's it's a very interesting topic on its own but uh, maybe we can save it for a later day okay let's say <laughs> and now maybe back back to your experience and I know that you do a lot of teaching at Alto. You said that you really like it. And uh, so what do you teach here? Uh, yeah, well, uh, doing saying that I do like a lot of teaching is like, 
exaggerating a little bit, although like I put a lot of energy into it because mm-hmm. I really like it. Uh, so far, my teaching activity was um, essentially related to this course in the bachelor's uh, program of le- electric electrical engineering here mm-hmm. in Alto. I'm starting to translate because it's given in, in Finnish, so it's... Uh, oh, the course is given in Finnish. In the, yeah, although like I don't speak Finnish, so I'm a bit of an <laughs> exception in there. And I'm a teaching assistant in this course that is called Applied Digital Signal Processing uh, mm-hmm. together with uh, Antti Kusinen, which is the um, lead instructor in the course. Um, I've been two years now teaching assistant in the course, which went really well. We were in the top 10 of the courses of ELEC last year, so I guess people nice. Congrats. liked it. Uh, thank you. And I really like this course. It's uh, basically, an, its approach is like, we are trying to show you many of the things in the world of digital signal processing mm-hmm. that you can end up doing, whether it's audio, image, video, or telecommunications. And the goal is like, okay, theory is that, but let's try to do a, a something that is adds on while we have knowledge of what we are doing. So the course is structured in order to have like a collection essentially of seminars. Mm-hmm. Uh, each with a different topic, but a very general topic, whether it's literally uh, audio signal processing, spatial audio, image processing, telecommunications, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to, from every seminar, every lecture uh, is followed by an assignment, which is a very simple, but kind of uh, real implementation of something related to that word. Whether it's like applying a very simple linear predictive based uh, speech, code, sp- speech codec, or like try to... Um, create, uh, synthesize um, an HRTF, a head-related transfer mm-hmm. function, applying very simple time scale modification method, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in this course, like I'm in charge of uh, one of the lectures, the one regarding, uh, one of the two lectures regarding audio. And I am, as I said, the main TA. So I work with the students to help their, them with the assignments. Uh, so I also correct their assignment, which is like less fun. <laughs> And I am mentoring some of the final projects that have to be done with the, with the, um, at the end of the course. Uh, besides the activity with this course, I will probably start TAing the audio signal processing course in the Masters of uh, Acoustics and Audio Technology. And I have supervised some bachelor thesis, uh, which were all, I have to say, very interesting uh, works at the end of the day. I won't say that I, I was the common factor in them because I was <laughs> not, but they were actually really interesting work. There are some people out there that really know what they're doing. Cool. So uh, it must must be, must be give you a lot of satisfaction. It is. It's, it's uh, I think to me, like it's, it's I, I get this very rewarding feeling when you're passing knowledge to someone or you're like mentoring someone towards a goal and you see them learn something, achieve something, and get pa- getting passionate about what they're doing, even like even if your contribution was like was like this small, mm-hmm. you contributed to that, and like that gives me like a really nice, really nice feeling. Right. Hopefully, we're doing something like this right now. Let's just hope that it will help someone who wants to get into audio research. Definitely. But back to teaching, maybe what's uh, the biggest challenge when it comes to teaching audio related stuff to students uh, teaching audio related stuff I would say probably especially if you don't if you if you don't come from an audio background and you're lacking some of the basic concepts that's the hardest part like getting okay, yeah. the very basic so for example explaining to someone how a short time Fourier transport works mm-hmm. usually is not the simplest task if they don't have that concept really clear Um because then after that, it's all a matter of like, you know, how deep you want to go into that. But I really found out that probably teaching the basics is the harder things. While when you have them, then it's much easier for anything else like to stick. Anything you want to teach someone else sticks much easier if they know the basic that they go through. But I think this is also common, not just for audio, but for every other course. Uh, and also, I remember this as a student, when you start your, especially if you study engineering, mm-hmm. uh, you do all this, you know, analysis or algebra courses at, or physics courses at the very beginning. And you're asking yourself, why, <laughs> why am I doing this? Like, what is the, what is the end goal of doing this yeah. kind of stuff? And then you actually start studying something that is related to what you're interested in. And you find out that it's not like just what shines from the outside, but all the, you know, there's so much math or so much physics behind everything that one, once you have the, understand the basics, so you understand what lies beneath everything else, understanding the rest and moving forward towards, you know, that, 
getting something new it's much easier uh, so I would say definitely definitely that also I would say it's worth mentioning that I come from like um we would call it a school but like a, a, a th- like a thought school or I wouldn't know how to call that in English uh, but an approach like to learning and to university which is very different from from Italy uh, mm-hmm. the Italian university I found out to be like uh, you're uh, very you can be very strict like they don't people don't really care if you like you get if you fail an exam or not mm-hmm. so once you get a pass then everything is is good everything above a pass every, everyone is happy uh, just because you have to actually fight to get there um well like the approach here was completely different it's, it's more like okay do not abandon the students like let's try to get them to like what you are what we are doing here understand what it makes through so it's really easy like to get a student bus but then you you have very few students that get like passionate about what they're doing and they are actually the one that um, excel mm-hmm. okay and when it comes to to this uh, to teaching and what you said that uh, the fluency in the basics do you also feel like teaching has also helped you to better understand the basics and to get better at the basics or not that much uh well it was uh, probably definitely yes it was nice going back to do some integral comp- computation which <laughs> hasn't been in a while but I, i think more that you know understanding the basics it was more that it helped me um passing on the knowledge of those basics you know lots of because lots of the time especially if you're not involved in teaching you have those basics that you acquire Mm -hmm. but then you never discuss them anymore Mm -hmm. so if you have to pass that knowledge like someone else maybe it's not that easy because it's something that you give so much for granted that okay i've never said this thing out loud since my exam Mm -hmm. five years ago or 10 years ago and actually getting to gets like help someone else understanding them gets you in the position okay it's really easy to to phrase something in the good way and that helps you a lot when you're discussing your research Mm -hmm. because it helps you like um get uh, phrase things and write down things in a way that is more easily understandable for someone that doesn't know what you're talking about and that like i think it's a it's a huge thing it's a huge um achievement of some kind Right. Um, yeah. Actually, actually, I, I I think it also was was one of the the purposes of of you know grounding this this channel and blog. Mm-hmm. And I I see it's it's quite a challenge to formulate things in a in a clear way, uh, but at the same time it it is rewarding and it it yeah. actually helps then mm. afterwards. Yeah. After after like your teaching experience and your learning experience, what would you what advice would you give to students? who maybe are not your direct students here, but maybe are listening to this and would like to get better at processing audio. Hmm. Uh, going hands-on, it's the it's the best thing. Uh, the best, always the best way, you know, like to make your knowledge stick is like apply what you have studied. So, you know, just, just get your laptop and, and start doing things is, is the best, is the best way to make things stick. Uh, it, you can use like the, whatever is the normal research approach. So read about something, find something that you kind of like or think that you might be interested in, study the thing and then try to apply the work of someone else. Oh, you make it work. And then you find out, okay, I do think that the, I could do this thing. Maybe this thing that I've studied would work better if I do this other thing instead. Try the thing out, make an hypothesis. And that's like, then it becomes like, you know, a, a snowfall of things that brings <laughs> to something else. And you don't, uh, you, one day you wake up and you're doing research about it. You know? <laughs> and there's also like, I think this big disconnection that is like even bigger in audio, just because of like how related to our perception is mm-hmm. from like theory to practice. Sometimes like knowing about a phenomenon and actually like, get that like listen to that Mm -hmm. stimulus and see how things can go terribly wrong if you do something in the wrong way is like it's very important yeah you know something in theory but like apply that Uh, i think that that is a big thing to do um okay maybe switching switching gears a little bit uh like i think that we can safely assume that doing a phd is not like a like a normal nine to five job <laughs> and you already said that it's it's uh, very important to get good at time management so how do you go to, uh, how do you go about this 
by somehow uh, splitting your time between time for research and time for your own personal stuff and also how how do you recover or get back the energy that you lost during research <laughs> or that you put into research yeah yeah and well to begin with i don't think i am a good example of that anymore <laughs> i don't know what happened throughout like my journey i used to be very good at time management time management and i'm not anymore which is weird uh but there is like one point like one premise that had to be made i think that if someone chooses to go throughout the phd path they have to take into account that this has to be their priority. So mm -hmm. everything else that comes after that should not be prioritized over your work. Because like, this is like a key moment in your life. This is where you're gonna like put your effort and your energy. And if you're not passionate about your topic, then doing this gets really hard, like prioritizing your work up above everything else. So Keyword getting into research is like be passionate about the things you're studying. But then, as you said, time management gives everything. So uh, I guess the beginning of the PhD studies is much easier at the beginning because like, yeah, you have to do your literal, big literature study, but you have less things going on mm -hmm. like in your research. But then like when you're starting doing things, you're going to have many projects going on at the same time. It doesn't get that easy. It's key that you plan in advance, like have a general idea of what you want to do um, I wouldn't say almost every day of your week. So plan a, plan ahead the time that you want to dedicate to everything. And it's okay like if your schedule is not super tight, mm -hmm. but just have an idea that, okay, I have I want to dedicate 50% of my week time to this project. And you work 50% of your time to the project. Maybe you work 60 or maybe you work overtime to get that 50. Mm -hmm. Both are okay. Just let, know what your goal is. Um the other thing, uh, as you uh, as you said, uh, like deadlines are key in 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 this in the uh, well in every work essentially, but like for us especially. So know ahead what are you targeting to publish into. So know that okay, I want to go at that conference. I know that the deadline to to submit a paper to that conference or that journal is this day. So this has to be done by that day, and make like a. Like a project plan, so many steps mm -hmm. uh, in advance. It's really hard when you're planning something, uh, especially if it's a long term, um, a long term um, project that you're working into, to get to the end without like many intermediate steps. Mm -hmm. Many intermediate steps gives you a sense of accomplishment, gives you more energy because you feel like yeah, I'm progressing and moving forward, and gets you there. That's the biggest step I felt when I get into research is that. When you're moving from being a student where you have like, ah, oh, okay, maybe you have an assignment every week mm -hmm. or you have an exam every like other month, it's really easy to plan stuff because like the window, time window is really short. But when you're working with something that might take months, years of your time, you really have to plan kind of ahead where you want to go. You don't have to know exactly where you're heading with the, with the time, but just have a, an idea of what you want to do and like make all these small steps in between. Uh, the other thing that you mentioned, because of course we need to have a life, is yeah, you need to have something else outside of the academia mm -hmm. where when you need to like you know release the stress of like taking this kind of job. Uh, for me, of course, like I do rugby, which is like a contact sport, so it's really easy, you know, to let the steam off. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's really important that you find something to do to that is not related to academia, so that your br your brain detaches from like thinking about your research for a while and then it gets back to it with like even more well, even more steam so to summarize a phd is not like a normal nine to five job and you need to above all anticipate what's coming and then plan ahead but prioritize your phd work in the first place but also have something on the side where you can relax and don't think about your research and uh, you, you mentioned rugby you mentioned music could you maybe elaborate on this? Well, uh, sure. Those are like my two main hobbies since forever, I guess. Especially rugby. Like I'm, I've started when I was six, and I'm still playing now, which yes. is like I think it's, <laughs> it's it's really great. So it's it's a huge part of my life. Has been a huge part and will, will be. I play in the one of the local teams. So in the um, Helsinki Rugby Club, it's called my called my current rugby team. We have we are back to back Finnish champions. So we won last year and this year the national title, which felt great. And awesome. uh, it's 
it's a really it's a really nice group of people uh, everyone of course is welcome to join if they en- ended up in Helsinki and want to try some rugby but uh, I'm of course very biased but I think that rugby is a, a magnificent sport um, beautiful activity to do um, for just like lots of your values as a as a, as a human being because mm-hmm. like teaches you sacrifice teaches you commitments and how to work in a team uh, which are like I think big big values to to live by and yeah you also mentioned my my music activity I uh, how can I define myself well it's better if I say what kind of music I do I have uh, uh, back in Italy still they are still active I have a hip-hop duo and a, a rap metal band uh, the duo is called Fuego and Shiver, and the metal and the band the metal band is called Entropicamente. You can find both uh, either Spotify, YouTube, or whatever channel. And music has always been like my second steam valve, uh, re- uh, stress release valve uh, in in my life. Um, I I rap in both of those those groups. I try to sing i have been trying to work on my singing skills but like especially given some of the people that i work with that have some some magnificent voice i'm nowhere close to them but i'm most of all like i'm a lyricist i really like to write co- very complicated lyrics and express like my my feeling and elaborate on my life through them uh and i think it's it, it was it was really good it saved me uh lots of money in therapy i would say throughout, throughout the years <laughs> Uh, and yeah, I think it's it's producing music is something that is really really cool because you know it's once you put out your music, it's something that can be eternal. You know, it's a piece of you that is out there, and the way I do think that you can communicate and um and your feelings and and pass them on, like you can do with uh any kind of uh, arts, whether it's like you know uh, discussing paintings or movies or in our case music, it's so powerful and more than you know just talking with someone Mm -hmm. because you're uh, elaborating something that is like inside of you um and giving it a this kind of artistic form it's 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 beautiful and with music i do think that it's like so much so more much more powerful because it's not visual you're using like another one of our senses Mm -hmm. like to uh, pass on something and it's so so cool definitely connects like on a deeper level yeah exactly something that is like yeah, many many layers uh, below the surface. Yeah, uh, definitely. I have listened to your bands and I really like them, uh, especially of course the, the metal band. Uh, but that's what I that's what uh, grabbed my attention. That actually uh, the, the the lyrics and the rhythm like meld together very very well. So definitely, congrats on this. And uh, as we mentioned before, there will be links in the. Uh, show notes on the dondewolfsound.com come and check us out yeah exactly i i recommend you (laughs) and uh, you mentioned that you also like yeah you said that you play rugby here in helsinki Mm -hmm. which sounds as if you like integrated in the uh, finnish society very well (laughs) but uh, i think it's very interesting because you had this transition from Italy to Finland, which in terms of the climate, I think are very different. But uh, on a like a broader perspective, how how was it for you? And uh, maybe what were the, the challenges of moving from Italy to Finland? Well, it's of course, like as everyone can imagine, like it's a big change, like the, the Nordic lifestyle is quite different. And it's also worth mentioning that, of course, I'm living in Helsinki now, which is even like a smoother transition, could have been like even a harsher, you know, uh, impact if I would have moved anywhere else in Finland, because like Helsinki is like the capital city, there is a nice melting pot, so it's 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 easier like mm-hmm. to adjust. Yeah. But still, you know, it's a different lifestyle, you have the seasons work differently, like it's pretty dark pretty soon and uh, well in the summer like there is lots of light that, I, that i'm not used to and the whole human contact with people is like very different like uh, italians on average like it's, it's sad to go with cliches but we are very uh, easygoing people very loud people <laughs> very gesticulating people it's really uh, easy for us like to make contact with another mm-hmm. person well i wouldn't say that like uh, the nordic um lifestyle is colder it's just that people are a little bit more 
uh, by themselves. They learn to be independent really early mm-hmm. in their life because like lots of people move outside. The, as far as I know, they move outside of their family houses like when they're 18, 19. So they learn to be independent really early in their life, which I think it's uh, it's really cool. Mm-hmm. It like, gives you lots of responsibility from the very beginning. And that contributes you know, to a more like... Um, um, not even introvert, just an independent mm-hmm. lifestyle. But then it's really easy when when you get to know someone to get them to open to you, and it's it's pretty cool. Uh, of course, like I think the biggest cultural clash for me was like food related. That was oh. like a bit traumatic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but for the rest, I would say I would say I'm adjusted. I'm adjusting. I was very lucky because like I don't know what kind of Italian I am, but I hate the heat completely <laughs> and i like love myself in finding in a really cold environment so when i came here for my thesis and it was like the late part of 2018 and it started snowing so much it was like minus 20 degrees i would say wow am i like in heaven or what <laughs> then i went you know i went up in lapland i visited the santa claus village i talked to santa claus and it was like ah like i'm meant to be here yeah, and uh, he speaks Italian actually. Yeah, with a very funny accent, I have to say, <laughs> but he speaks Italian. I was very impressed. <laughs> so, so, I think for me the biggest cultural shock was that you need to wave your hand for the bus to stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a painful way to uh, learn this. Well, if I would say that my co- biggest cultural shock is that public transportation actually works here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's completely true. I agree, and. Uh, maybe if someone wants to like if students want to move here from abroad like is there any advice you can give him give them at this point um if you mean like in general like you're a student that is about to move to finland exactly yeah um i would say first of all don't be don't be afraid of like get out and meet new people with any of the unconventional methods that we have online we have the the uh, the internet today that gives us so many like uh, approaches like to meet new people, so don't be afraid of doing that, mm-hmm. if, even if it just feels weird because like it's very normal. Here, seek all the social opportunities that you can get because it's really easy in Finland if you don't know anyone to like remain alone, mm-hmm. stay by yourself. Yeah. Just find yourself like some kind of extra activity, some kind of sport. Don't be afraid of approaching people because like you just you need some some human contact in your life. And w- once you have started creating your own group of friends, then it's life gets really really easier here here in finland that would be the biggest advice luckily especially for students um there are many many activities that are programmed uh, in the campus uh that like seek this kind of social interactions a uh, really cool thing about especially the university uh here in finland that I, at least in Italy, it doesn't exist, is this concept of guilds. Every faculty have their own guilds, mm-hmm. um, which have all their, you know, overalls with patches and stuff. <laughs> they all have all these semi-competitive activities that go, go on. And I think it's really cool. It really promotes, like, having this kind of student life mm-hmm. and and kind of social gatherings that basically help, help you through, like, what could be a tough moment in your life. Yeah, and it gives you this, these guilds maybe give you this feeling that you belong somewhere. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very that's a very good point. I think one point maybe to mention here that is very uh, that makes the transition much much easier compared to other countries is that in Finland everyone speaks perfect English. Oh, and yeah. And it's so amazing and it's so easy to communicate with anyone. And I also find found the administrative stuff very clearly written Mm -hmm. so it's not problematic to understand what you have to do and on top of this like the the clerks are really really nice and Mm -hmm. they always take the time to answer your questions and help you if you need anything Mm -hmm. so i i guess uh finland's government make make the transition for foreigners to finland very very easy and approachable Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think like you. I think you hit home with everything you just mentioned in this list. Uh, the latter first. Uh, I do think that people like one one good quality of the people here, like in Finland, is that they are they can they are really honest. So they can be also brutally honest sometimes, <laughs> but uh, they are also like uh, inherently good. Like they are meant like to help other people. There is like this really nice um, behavior that people have towards you. Uh, they don't have that many prejudices if you're like a foreigner, especially mm-hmm. if you're in Helsinki, they have none. 
And the other two things that you mentioned, everybody speaks English, which makes it really easy. I, that's not something that I'm used to in Italy. <laughs> and the other thing is that, as you said, like everything from like the document point of view is really well done. The mm -hmm. bureaucracy is like, it's not that heavy and it's well done, which is another thing that I'm definitely not used to, yeah. given that yeah. uh, Italian bureaucracy is like, <laughs> ah, something to be forgotten, probably. <laughs> so, yeah. Lots of things like lots of things work well here in Finland. Yeah, that's true. It is it is possible to have a working administration. Yeah. And so with this in mind, could you share maybe what are your plans for the nearest future? Well, uh, sure. As I said uh, earlier on, I am halfway through with my PhD studies, so I have two less than two years ahead of me now. Um, what I'm planning to do is like work towards my dissertation. I pretty much already know the publication schedule that I want to have and awesome. the projects that are clear in my head. So I kind of know what I'm going to have in the next two years uh, ahead of me on that point of view. And my goal is to conclude those research with possibly very good results. Uh, the other point is that, as I mentioned, I will probably take um, um, studying this teaching assistant activity in this master's course, the audio signal processing course, and I'm really excited for that. So what I'm expecting from them is like learn even more like in dealing with people that are definitely more passionate towards audio mm -hmm. to begin with, and essentially just having a teaching activity to uh, on a um, uh, higher higher level. What I hope to have in the next two years is like also supervising a master thesis. Because also I think that's like a really will be like a really cool thing to do, and that will probably be it. Uh, I also hope that in the next two years I will also have an idea of what comes for me after the, the PhD. Mm -hmm. You know that that's that's a that's always a, a big question. If you want to stay in academia, if you can stay in academia, or are you going in the industry? And I still have a little bit of time to think about that, but we'll see in in, in two years from now. Cool. So all the best with your plans. Ooh, thank you. And maybe to add to this, uh, because it may not be clear, I think, for everyone. So your plan is essentially to publish a certain number of, of uh, papers mm -hmm. and then compile this into one dissertation and uh, have have this as your dissertation as your dissertation as opposed to to writing one big monograph on a certain topic. Exactly. As you said, uh, there are essentially two ways to conclude a PhD and have your thesis. It's like one, as you said, doing a monograph regarding your uh, your topic where you actually, mm -hmm. what you write is a, is a proper book to begin to the end. Or the other way, which is much more preferred, at least here in Alto, is uh, to have essentially like a compilation of, uh, like a selection of your publications, mm -hmm. uh, which is... Uh, prefaced by like um essentially a description of your work uh, which is kind of a compressed monograph and like an introduction mm -hmm. to the work it gives uh, came throughout your uh, your publication the idea is, is again that you're telling a story that was uh, your research work in this like mm -hmm. in the four years that you've done your phd and you produce a document that is a, a all effects a book that can be freely uh, consulted by everyone and that you're gonna defend eventually but in my case, yeah, this is what I'm I'm rooting for. I will have like a, a compilation of my uh, publications, and that will be prefaced by like the rest of the document, and I hope it's gonna be something interesting. Well, I, if you ask me, it is gonna be interesting, but that's my topic, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit biased. <laughs> I'm certain it will be it will be interesting. Uh, and then with this in mind, uh, I wanted to ask you like, is PhD for everyone? What I mean by this is that uh, I've heard many, uh, let's say, in engineering students who say like they would like to do a, a PhD, but they're just so afraid that they will they won't manage because it's so hard. What's what's your take on this? Um, I have to agree on that. I do think that the PhD is not for everyone because you require essentially two things to start a PhD. Number one, you need to be passionate about your topic. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether like you can get passionate about it or being it already, they both work, but you have to be passionate about it because you have to stick with the topic for four years or three years. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, if you don't like what you're doing, you're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so that's it. And the second thing, because you may be passionate about it, but you have to kind of like the idea of doing research. So what you kind of like to do has to be, as I mentioned earlier, push the boundary of knowledge 
mm-hmm. bit further more than okay let's implement what we have now okay which are two and everything both of them like are really fine we need both people in the world uh but yeah like when you're passionate about something you know either you have research or you have develop development typically and people may like one not the other and vice versa or like both but like you have to have this kind of um uh, kind of drive inside you that tells yeah i want to know everything about this <laughs> thing and i want to like do better than what it is out there now which is like not not easy and you actually like uh, pointed out a really big thing that uh, students sometimes are scared uh, because like this word, you know, PhD or doctoral mm-hmm. study sounds, yeah, yeah. sounds so sounds big. Serious. Yeah, it is, and it, it is really mm-hmm. serious. But I think that uh, if more effort would have uh, been put on, or it would be put in general, like in explaining what a doctoral mm-hmm. uh, program actually is and what it constitutes of and what you need to get in there, probably m- more people would like try to, to mm-hmm. attend a PhD. Yeah, it was a bit like, of like art. Yeah, p- pretty much. Because, you know, like, I know, and not just in the audio field, but in general, people mm-hmm. that maybe, like, during their university studies for one reason or the other, maybe they weren't the real top of their class in terms of, like, grades, because maybe they were struggling with a couple of things, yeah. but they had, like, these great minds that they were really passionate about mm-hmm. something that turned out to be great researchers. Definitely. I, th- I think Albert Einstein, right, is, uh, uh, is like, the, 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 the most well-known mm-hmm. example of this yeah, and there was there was one thing that uh, I I really liked uh, in what you said. I think it was this like not everyone needs to be a researcher basically. So if your calling is to be a researcher, that that's great. If mm-hmm. not, that that's great too, and that's beautiful mm-hmm. in in this world. And that's uh, and there is one more thing that is like worth uh, mentioning is that it is really okay to try and leave halfway through like maybe you try to be one and you realize this is not your call and i think that in our society like it's, failure is so stigmatized like saying oh i tried and i failed oh no it's so stigmatized to be a bad thing but mm-hmm. we all need to be mistakes right yeah, that's, that's how we find out who we are so it's really okay to try to do something and not succeeding as long as you know you get back on your feet and do something else after that yeah because you always learn something from this yeah yeah yeah. and and on the reverse i also heard about people who went to the industry uh let's say two years and then said okay i want to do a phd and actually came back to academia like we know an example of a, a, a successful doctoral student who actually worked i don't know like 10 years in the industry mm-hmm. before going back to academia and uh, it's of course it's another challenge, but it is possible definitely. So, at the end of this interview, uh, I wanted to ask you if someone wanted to reach out to you, contact you, or find out more about you. Where can they find you online? Well, I guess the simplest way because it collects everything that I have. Uh, there is a website regarding my persona, which is simply my name dot me Leonardo Fierro dot me. Uh, but also every other channel would be fine. So my email, my institutional email is like leonardo.fierro uh, uh, <laughs> leonardo.fierro at alto.fi. Sorry, some Italian popped out <laughs> of my mind. Uh, I have an Instagram handle. I'm not really a social media person, but like the only social media that I kind of use is Instagram, which is there. Uh, hi, my name is Fuego. Uh, or... Uh, that's I would be pretty much it. If you're more interested in actually my, my research work, I would... Uh, recommend definitely either my research gate or my LinkedIn pages. Again, just pop t- pop in my name. I'm pretty much there is just me, and I think I have a Mexican homonym that doesn't work in audio, so it's really easy to find <laughs> me. And that would be pretty pretty much it. I wouldn't. I, I think it's best if I don't give my phone number, although it's really easy <laughs> to find it <laughs> anyway. Although it is. It may be pretty expensive to call you on your Finnish phone number uh, from anywhere else around the world. Uh, but yeah, I will definitely put links to all these resources that you mentioned in the in the podcast notes. And maybe one final thing. I know that you're also involved in organizing the YouTube channel of the Alto Acoustics Lab, right? Yeah, I'm I'm part of the 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 the, the um uh, Acolab channel team. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't deal uh 
um, directly with the YouTube channel and more like I, I know it's in direct uh, opposition with what I just said, but I'm like <laughs> in charge of the social media pages, oh, okay. uh, which at the moment just constitute of like an Instagram page. Uh, handle is at Alto Acoustics Lab, so go check it out. But essentially, yeah, we have this project that started with the channel, which because it really feels that uh, we could use a boost for uh, promoting our research. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of like really good research work in um, in the academic world are very limited by a really poor PR. Mm -hmm. An important part of like what you do is like advertise your research. Exactly. Yeah. And that was the idea behind the channel that, yeah, let's have one more way of putting out our research. So the goal of the channel now on the channel, we already have a virtual binaural tool of the lab, which I highly suggest the pretty cool shows up, shows some of our facilities. But the idea is that we're going to produce some of the videos like to present the people that are working here in the lab and their work. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea is that, okay, you publish a paper, you have something to show to the world. Let's make a video of it and let's let people know that you did that. Yeah, and then it's also it's easy to discover it and then maybe even discuss it in the comments. Definitely, so yeah. Great. And also then you have the Instagram page uh, where we're going to do like essentially funny stories and posts regarding <laughs> the, the activities here in the lab. Everything that that advertises our work is a, is a successful thing at the end of the day. Awesome. So definitely go check out the Alto Acoustics Lab YouTube channel. Subscribe to this channel. To them, mm -hmm. subscribe to Wolf Sound. Definitely. And Best YouTube channel. <laughs> and follow all the uh, media resources because there are like there's a lot of cool stuff going on there. Mm -hmm. Leonardo, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you for this interview. I'm sure that the listeners will be very interested in what your PhD involves. And I hope to feature you on a future session of podcast again because... I think we barely touched on some of the topics. Mm. Thank you very much. Definitely. I had a great time as well. Thanks for having me here. I hope everyone enjoyed the video and the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, everyone. That was Leonardo Fierro of Alto Acoustics Lab. If you want to contact him, go to leonardofierro.me. It's Leonardo Fierro with double R dot M E. As usual, all references that we mentioned during this podcast can be found under dwolfsound.com slash talk002. Once again, it's dwolfsound.com slash talk002. I think the best place if you're considering starting a career in research or programming related to audio is the Wolf Sounds Audio Programming Newsletter. There you will get a weekly digest of Wolfsound's content and also tips and tricks that comes from experience of others and me in audio programming. To sign up today, go to thewolfsound.com slash newsletter. Thanks for listening and see you in the next session. Take care.